Like Dixieland style? Uh, yeah, like, like, the, like the old four-string banjos. Yeah. You know, I was more of a four-string banjo type strummer than I was a picker. I always liked the Dixieland jazz sound. I always played oh, I love Dixieland. Man, that's my favorite music, Dixieland. Yeah, I love it. Larry, I was trying to teach me one time how to play Pete Seeger style banjo. I kind of gave up on it after a while. Uh, what is that, claw hammer type? Sort of, yeah. Yeah. Claw hammer, but you up pick. You mm -hmm. down, up, down, yeah, up, down, yeah. up, down, up, down, up. And it got really repetitive, and my brain kept going back to just claw hammer. Yeah. <laughs> Slow it down. He'd always tell me, Steve, you gotta slow it down, Steve. <laughs> All right, buddy. Well, start off with just tell us your name and how many years you've been here <coughs> in this great city of Moorhead. Just look at me. I'll, I'll look at the camera here and I'll make sure everything's sitting right. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Well, my name is Steve Young. I have been a virtual lifelong resident of Moorhead and Round County. Um, I uh, did a little graduate work. I was away in Indiana for a little while, but uh, came back and spent 33 years at Moorhead State University uh, as a professor of education, a couple of years in the public schools before that, and uh, retired back in 2001. One of the things I did when I retired was to look around for something I could do for the community and, and uh, found this project just sitting there waiting. <laughs> as they're always, as they always are, right? <laughs> well, to start off with, uh, you know, doing some early histories of the university here, and if you could, tell us what the Round County War was. People don't know. What was the Round County? Well, the Round County War, or Round County Feud, as it was uh, re often called, um, was a result of an election, uh, as so often things do. Uh, back then, elections were held in August, hot, blistering day, and tempers were flaring a very close election for sheriff. Words were exchanged, shots were exchanged, and an innocent bystander fell dead. Um, there were two major clans in town at that time, the Tollivers and the Martins. The Tollivers had been uh, Confederate sympathizers and were Democrats. The Martins had been Union uh, sympathizers and they were Republicans. So there, there wasn't a lot of uh, love lost between the two to begin with. But anyway, um, each faction claimed that the other had fired the fatal shot that had killed this, this bystander. Uh, and it was an interesting thing that the court actually indicted both Floyd Tolliver and John Martin for the same killing. Um, but before they could, uh, before they could actually uh, be tried, uh, they met in a local bar called Saloon, called the Galt House. Uh, again, words were exchanged. John Martin drew his revolver and shot Floyd Tolliver in the chest and killed him. Uh, he was immediately arrested, but because they were afraid of uh, lynching, uh, him being lynched, they actually took him to jail in Winchester, had him jailed down there. Well, the Tollivers weren't content to let uh, the justice system, you know, work its way, so they forged some papers uh, pretending to be deputy sheriffs and uh, got him released from the, from the Winchester jail, put him on a train bound for Moorhead. But at Farmers, uh, a band of armed men uh, stopped the train, boarded the train, and proceeded to give John Martin a case of severe lead poisoning. He died the next morning. So now there had been a killing on both sides. And that's, that was really the beginning of the, of the feud proper. Uh, the thing about the Round County feud that made it so unique, I think, was the fact that um, unlike, say, the Hatfield-McCoy feud, Hatfield-McCoy's went on for about 30 years. The, the Round County feud, the Martin Tolliver feud, only lasted about three years. But in those three years, there were more people killed and wounded uh, than in 30 years of the Hatfield-McCoy feud. So actually it was a, a much more deadly uh, feud than, than that of Hatfield-McCoy. But uh, a lot of folks ask, well, how come you always hear about Hatfield-McCoy? And I guess they just had a better press agent. I don't, <laughs> I don't know why, but, uh, but you hear a lot about Hatfield-McCoy. You don't hear so much about the Round County feud. But anyway, the, the point being that uh, what made this feud so unique was the fact that it wasn't just the two clans. It wasn't just the two families. Very soon, they began to draw in other families. 
and other families and other families. And uh, over a period of those three years, uh, there were only three factions in the county. There were Martin supporters, there were Tolliver supporters, and there were the people who got the heck out of Brown County. Uh, literally, it got that bad. Many families did move out of the county. Uh, there was no such thing as being neutral. Because if you were neutral, you were suspect by both camps. And uh, in fact, my, uh, my relatives, uh, Z.T. Young, who at the time was county attorney, uh, for his troubles of trying to remain neutral, he was shot in the back uh, while, uh, while leaving town on a horseback one day. Uh, and it, it, it was that, that kind of a thing. So there were, there were literally hundreds of people uh, who were drawn into this feud on both sides. Well, over a period of time, uh, what would happen would be one would uh, win, win the election, their, or their faction would win the election. They would become very oppressive of, of the others. Then they would get voted out the next election, and the other side would oppress, and so on. And it just went back and forth. But over a period of time, the Tollivers gained the upper hand. And uh, they became quite ruthless, as a matter of fact. Uh, and so it got so bad. And in fact, uh, the National Guard was called in three times. The, the governor sent in the National Guard to quell things. Uh, and the, the Guard would come in. Of course, they would no more than uh, hear the whistle blow of the train coming into town until all the shots would, you know, silence. We'd be a model community for the next two or three days while the Guard was camped out here on the courthouse lawn. But as soon as the guard left, why, shots would ring out again and, and so on. My grandfather related that. He said day and night, uh, there was never more than a 20 or 30 minute period in which there would be a volley of shots somewhere in town. And uh, it was just really that bad and just quite, quite ruthless. And um, the sheriffs typically were, again, of one clan or the other or one faction or the other. And as a result, uh, you might get justice if you were <laughs> if you were in the right right faction. But if you were in the opposing faction, forget it. There was no justice to be had. So, uh, as I say, eventually over time, though, the Tollivers gained the upper hand and became so oppressive that uh, again the sheriff went to the governor. The governor had threatened to dissolve the county. He said, "If you don't clean this up, we'll just dissolve this county." And uh, uh, so the sheriff went to him again to send troops. He said, I've sent troops three times. I'm not going to do it anymore. You straighten this out. So the sheriff uh, went to uh, Cincinnati, purchased 30 new Winchester repeating rifles, uh, came back and uh, armed what he called a group of regulators. They were just vigilantes. These were not just Martin folks, however. They were just people in town that were just sick and tired of all the violence and wanted an end to it. So uh, there were about 30 of them, 30 or 35 of them, and uh, they surrounded the town. Now the town, of course, was much smaller then. The plan was to put a net around the town and close the net and then box the Tollivers in, give them a chance to surrender. But uh, as they were closing the nets, they were spotted by the Tollivers and shots were exchanged and then it became a running gun battle. The Tollivers were badly outnumbered so as a result, uh, they fought a retreating action and they would run into a building. Uh, in fact, the building that we're shooting in right now was, was part of that because this was one of the first buildings that they ran into, exchanged some shots with the regulators, then moved on to another building, exchanged some shots again. This happened about two or three different times until they were finally cornered on up the street from this building. Um, and uh, finally the, the gun battle came to an end with about uh, three or four, well, there were four uh, Tolliver supporters and Tolliver uh, family members that were killed uh, in that gun battle. And uh, uh, that actually brought an end to the, what should we say, the, the extreme violence of the, of the feud. Certainly there were hard feelings that uh, continued for many, many years after that. Uh, but uh, with, uh, with that gun battle over, then, as I say, the, the, many of the Tollivers were, were actually forced to, to leave the county. Over the years, many of them have come back. Uh, but now the two families are, of course, good friends, no problems today. But, um, but that, was the, that was the Round County feud in a nutshell. And uh, well, what, what start talking a little bit about the history of the rail line here in Moorhead. When did the railroad uh, first come through Moorhead? Well, the first railroad uh, that came through Moorhead was actually the Elizabethtown, Lexington, and Big Sandy Railroad. 
This was a railroad uh, based in Elizabethtown. Uh, there had been a previous railroad they had tried to build and it had, not, had failed. Uh, but the, uh, the ELMBS uh, and, and built a line from Elizabethtown to Ashland, terminated in Ashland. And uh, they came through Moorhead in 1881 and uh, laid the rail through here in that year. And that was the year that the uh, freight station here, that we're, where we are now, uh, was built. And uh, it served at that time both passenger and freight service. The area where we are right now was the passenger service and uh, uh, passenger area. And uh, then the back of the building was the, was the freight area. Um, later, when the depot, which sits about 50 or 60 yards east of here, was built, that was after the turn of the century, then, uh, then this building was used for freight only. Uh, but uh, it, uh, it was built in 1881. This building is now the oldest building in Round County. Um, but that was the first railroad. They operated for about 11 years. 1892, C&O Railroad bought them out. Um, C&O, of course, became one of, the, one of the largest railroads in the country, primarily through acquisition. The C&O did build some railroads, but mostly they acquired already existing railroads, and that's what they did with the ELMBS. So the line was, the, was exactly the same, but they were two different railroads. Um, then there were a couple of uh, uh, logging railroads that were narrow gauge, what we call narrow gauge railroads, uh, smaller, smaller railroads. And uh, one uh, ran up Christie Creek and uh, ran up there for about, oh, about four, four and a half miles. And the timber was brought back to a, a major mill there at Rodburn. Um, they timbered out the area. Um, about four years and uh, they called it quits, pulled up the rails and so on. Then another logging railroad ran again from Rodburn on up what is now US 60. Of course 60 wasn't there then but ran up and then up uh, Big Perry and uh, that was again a logging, narrow gauge logging railroad. And again they lasted for about four years just long enough to timber out the area and then and that railroad dissolved. Then there was another railroad that ran up Christie Creek later, and that was uh, because uh, clay, um, the clay mines for both uh, general refractories and then of course later for Lee clay products uh, were extremely important in the county. So there was a, um, a railroad that actually general refractories uh, put that railroad in. It was called the Christie Creek Railroad, and it ran up for about five, five and a half miles up Christie Creek up to the clay mines brought the clay back again to Rodburn, but this time the, the clay was transferred to C&O cars and then was dispersed on east. Um, and uh, that, that railroad actually ran until about 1948 when basically General Refractories began to close things down. The other railroad uh, was the Moorhead and North Fork Railroad. And Moorhead and North Fork uh, started in 1905, uh, again based on a, on a failed previous railroad. They had tried to build a railroad between Moorhead and uh, Morgan County, but it had gone bankrupt. So they bought out the right-of-way uh, from that. Uh, actually, it was Clearfield Lumber Company. They, uh, they wanted a means to get out there and get the timber, bring it back into Clearfield to the, to the mill. So, um, so they built uh, a railroad um, over Clack Mountain through a tunnel, over to Paragon, which is just short of the Morgan County line. Uh, through a tunnel there and then turning east and eventually south and over into Morgan County. Uh, a couple little communities called Wrigley and then finally Redwine, which is just about a, another mile or so on, on it from Wrigley. Um, and so they timbered a, a great deal. It was a timber railroad. Um, but they also found that passenger service, uh, because again there were no roads in 1881, uh, well, or, I'm sorry, in, in, in 1905 uh, when they went in. Uh, there were no uh, uh, no roads to speak of, so um, they established a, a passenger service between uh, Clearfield and Redwine, and uh, uh, had a spur then that came on up and connected to the CNO up here in, in Moorhead. What role did the uh, railroad play in the round? Mm -hmm. Well, the railroad itself, of course, didn't take didn't take sides in in terms of that. But uh, the railroad was involved in the, in the sense that again, uh, as I was explaining, when John Martin uh, was was killed by the the Tolliver clan, uh, of course, that was on uh, uh, that was on the on the railroad uh, running through uh, through Winchester toward toward Moorhead. 
And so in that sense, uh, it was uh, in involved, at least indirectly. And then, of course, as I say, the, the, uh, the freight station here was involved in the, in the final gun battle of the, of the feud and so on. But the railroad itself did not take any kind of sides in the, in the conflict. So how long was the rail line in Moorhead? Well, the, uh, the Moorhead North Fork, uh, as I say, uh, actually uh, pulled up stakes in 1973. Um, what had happened was that when the timbering became and uh, uh, passenger traffic became untenable or unprofitable, I should say, um, then they, they got permission to pull up the lines all the way from Red Wine back to Clack Mountain. Now they left the last four miles and the reason for that was that in the meantime, Lee Clay Products had moved in to Clearfield and needed high quality clay off of Clack Mountain. So the Moorhead and North Fork then uh, provided that service of hauling the clay from Clack Mountain down to the kilns there in, uh, in Clearfield. Um, so they uh, 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 provided that, that service there. Um, but they, uh, but when Lee Clay folded up, of course, along came plastics, PVC, and that pretty well spelled the end of Lee Clay. And so, uh, in 19, actually, Lee Clay closed up shop in 1970. Uh, the Moorhead and North Fork struggled on for another three years, trying to, they tried to haul a little bit of mill waste and that sort of thing, but uh, really were never profitable after Lee Clay shut down. And so in 73, they, uh, they closed the line. Uh, there was a local gentleman, uh, uh, so-called Bouge Armstrong, who, uh, and Bouge had designs on a tourist railroad. So he bought up the remains of the Moorhead and North Fork with the idea of a tourist railroad, but it just wasn't to be. It was far too expensive and uh, did not have the, the resources to do that. Uh, the C&O Railroad ran through here in, until 1985. They had actually ceased passenger service in the mid-70s but uh, they continued to run freight through here until 1985, and then they closed, closed the line and pulled the rails. Let's go all the way back to the end of the Alabama kind of River, um, to the founding of the Normal School. Now, it was the end of the Alabama County War, and there wasn't much time between that founding of the Normal School and the freight people button came to town. Well, it was uh, about that time. It was about that time, and of course, um, the, the idea was that uh, you, had, uh, you had the Moonlight School movement, um, you had the founding of uh, what was to become Moorhead State University, um, but they started out as very, very small uh, institutions. Um, of course, the Moonlight School movement uh, was founded for the purpose of uh, adult education, teaching adults to read. Well, people worked during the day. They couldn't go to a traditional school. So uh, uh, the, uh, the schools were opened at night, and that's the reason they called them moonlight schools and uh, taught adults to read, and, and, and many did, and many were able to uh, improve their lives a, gr a great deal as a result of that. That, that movement actually became nation uh, not only nationwide, but worldwide. You know. Now, uh, the founding of the normal school itself, I read once that Frank Button supposedly had the Dodge gunfire his first day at Moorhead. <laughs> so from, from history as you read or talked about, was it still lawless in the founding of the Golden School? Well, <sighs> lawless. <laughs> I wouldn't say lawless. I, w I would say, the, however, that um, certainly there was not as much law and order perhaps as there is today. I mean, it was, it was a different period of time. There was um, many arguments were settled with a a fist fight, uh, a knife fight, or in some cases a gun fight. Um, I'll just tell you one particular instance here. Um, my grandfather actually had a two-story house where a Mexican restaurant sits today uh, on Main Street there. Um, and uh, my uh, father was, uh, oh, probably nine or ten years old, something like that. Anyway, uh, from that house, you could actually catty corner, you could see across, and you could see the courthouse and the courthouse lawn. Well, there was a fellow by the name of Kate Tolliver. Now, Kate had been a young boy during the feud, but uh, was an honorary cuss, as they say. 
uh, had grown up to be a moonshiner. He had been accused of three different murders, and they hadn't proven anything. But anyway, not a, not the type that you'd want to invite, you know, in for Sunday dinner. Uh, so anyway, Kate uh, Kate had uh, had come to town, and uh, the uh, local sheriff had stopped him and said, "Look, Kate, if you want to come to town, it's okay, but you have to leave your gun at home." And Kate. Uh, being the independent types that that you know were so prevalent then, said I'll bring my gun anywhere I want. As a matter of fact, I'm going home to get it right now. And indeed he did. And the two met then on the courthouse lawn. And my father said it would have been funny if it hadn't been so serious. There was a huge tree. Um, the trunk was very large. And anyway, they both drew on each other and both of them hopped on either sides of that tree. And then they proceeded to start running around the tree, each of them trying to get around far enough to, you know, to get the drop on the other. And the sheriff just happened to, be, or the deputy sheriff, just happened to be a little bit faster than Kate and wounded him with one shot. And then Kate slumped down and the deputy sheriff came around and three more shots were dispatched and that was the end of Kate Tolliver. Uh, now, to give you some idea of the lawlessness, was the sheriff ever, or the deputy sheriff ever prosecuted? No, he was not. No, he was not. <laughs> I read Frank Button's, uh, what I could read on his handwriting, it was hard to read, an old journal he kept, and he was proud that, uh, this is maybe, turn of the century, 1900, he was proud to say that Morgan had no saloons in it anymore. <laughs> very pious man, mm -hmm. religious man. He was very proud of that. Well, of course, uh, you know, for many, many years, uh, Moorhead was was a dry community. Uh, Round was a dry county uh, for many, many years. Now, that didn't mean that people didn't drink, and it didn't mean that there, there, there wasn't liquor in the county, but it wasn't legal liquor, of course. Um, there were moonshiners in the area. Um, matter of fact, our museum is going to have uh, an example of one of the local moonshine stills uh, that was taken in a raid. Um, and of course then uh, liquor was brought in from other, you know, from other areas uh, and so on. And of course then you also went through the area of prohibition, uh, which nationwide, of course, suppo supposedly liquor was, uh, was outlawed. Um, but in, uh, of course, in 33, why, you know, prohibition was repealed and, and so on. But, um, it's only been in the last, and I would have to look up the date, but it's probably only been in the last 20 or 25 years that that Round County has actually been wet. You know? Steve, tell us who Allie Young was. Well, Allie Young was the son of Z.T. Young. The Z.T. Young that I was telling you about a moment ago, who was uh, actually shot and wounded during the, during the feud. Uh, Z.T. at that time took his family, Allie being one of his sons, uh, and, and took his family and uh, lived over in Mount Sterling, uh, basically until the feud was over, uh, and then moved back. But uh, Allie became uh, a lawyer, uh, like his father, and uh, in fact, like his brother, and um, became quite noted, and uh, then became a member of the Kentucky uh, uh, legislature as well, and uh, was a rather influential member of the legislature. Some said he was very powerful in terms of voice, and others said he was very powerful at twisting arms as well. But uh, whatever, whatever the the reason, he uh, seemed to get a lot of a lot of things done, and he was influential. He was not certainly the only force that was acting to get uh, a college established here in Moorhead, but he he was one of the one of the forces that helped to uh, to help to establish the uh, the college here at Moorhead. Well, you know. Well, that's true, but then that's that's true of about any president we've ever had. I mean, you know, they they've always had the folks that they seem to get along well with, and then there there are those that you know that they that they don't, and uh, that's uh, that's that's been pretty much true of about any president we've had that you'd care to name. <laughs> um. Talk a little bit about Ed Maggard. I, the reason why I say this is uh, Jack Ellis was the one that told me about this initially and that led me calling you back in the winter uh, when I found out that it was a cosmograph down here. But, uh, uh, 
Ellis told the story of uh, when the last member of the selection committee made the tie-breaking vote to get the state school to Morgan over Paintsville. Don Flat wrote that Allie Young persuaded him behind the scenes to change the vote. Mm -hmm. Jack Ellis said Ed Maggard had made a film about Moorhead that was used to show to the selection committee. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us that story? Well, he, he certainly did. Uh, Ed was originally from Sandy Hook, but he moved to Moorhead uh, very early on in the century and became just a, a man of of all talents in, in, in the community. I mean, he, he established the, the water plant, he established the ice plant, he established the electric uh, plant. Um, uh, he ran the first theater here in town. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's how the Cosmograph came to be. Ed was using one of uh, Edison's uh, model uh, projectors, and he noticed it had a bad flicker on the screen, and so he said, hey, we can do better than that. So